Hello, everyone. This is Bob Lowe, CSIA Executive Director, and thank you for attending the March CSIA webinar. Today's webinar is the second in a series of three on configuration management and focuses on manual systems for implementation. This series is intended to clear the fog on configuration management. Be sure to ask questions in the Q&A box, not the chat box. Uh, questions will be answered uh, during the webinar, so be sure to ask them. Um, the webinar will be archived for later viewing, and the slides will be made available also. Um, the host and sponsor of our monthly business topic webinars is Software Toolbox, a CSIA partner member. Software Toolbox understands that you're not just buying software licenses, but are investing in a relationship where you depend on your suppliers to be there every step of the way. And Software Toolbox encourages your engineers to understand the value of their time. So don't let them spend hours troubleshooting remote OPC connections. Send them to softwaretoolbox.com slash OPC for expert help and affordable off-the-shelf solutions. Now I'd like to introduce today's webinar presenter, Jeff Miller. Jeff is the Director of Project Management at Interstates Control Systems in Sioux Center, Iowa. He directs the company's project management and automation support teams, and he has successfully led Interstates through four CSIA certification audit cycles. Jeff is currently the treasurer on the CSIA Board of Directors and has served 12 years on the CSIA Best Practices and Benchmarks Committee for those years as chairman. Jeff is a project management professional with PMI and is actively involved in the project management community through the Sioux Empire chapter of the Project Management Institute. So without further delay, here's Jeff Miller. Thank you, Bob. I uh, look forward to presenting today. Uh, configuration management is certainly one of those things that as an integrator, uh, and going through the certification cycles that we've been through. Um, it's one of the things we struggled with a lot in the past, and I, and, uh, I would say um, we are not perfect at it by any means yet, but we are certainly growing, and I, I hope I can uh, give you some good information today. So we'll be, uh, we're going to be talking about manual systems today, uh, and uh, that will explain itself here pretty soon. Um, I'm going to build on some of the things that uh, Hank Yan put together for our last presentation, which was really just around the uh, what is configuration management all about. Uh, today we'll start looking at first steps. He talked a lot about the, the maturity cycle of configuration management, and uh, this is some of those first levels of uh, maturity in, in uh, configuration management. Uh, so we're going to go back again to Chapter 7.6 out of our Best Practices Manual, and this is what it's kind of what it's defined as. Configuration management is the practice of handling changes systematically so that the system maintains its integrity over time. So we'll be spending some time looking at uh, what you'll, you know, what this all encompasses in a manual fashion today. Um, some of the slides you're going to see today are repeats of uh, what Hank John had put together uh, because I think it's important to keep in our mind what configuration management is all about. It's it, your reason you need it, it's so that you always have reliable information. If somebody needs to know, um, you know, wh where's the latest as build version of something or, uh, you know, something like, uh, have we processed all of our um, all of our revisions and made sure they're in the file? And do I have you know complete files? That type of thing. A lot of this may seem like you know that it's not that important, but the the larger you get as a company, this becomes harder and harder to maintain. It's easy when you've got your hands around the the fewer of your engineers, but as you get 40, 50 engineers, it's a lot harder to maintain without a system in place. So that's kind of where you start. Um, it's still all about change control, and this is out of the best practices manual as well, this methodology of on the, on the left-hand side of, of the V where you're 
developing your requirements and your design, the bottom being the development phase of the project and the other side being where you test and implement and the traceability that's between those two. And that traceability really shows when you start looking at uh, do I know that everything that I did uh, actually wound up going into the system? Everything that was supposed to be there, did it wind up there? And we'll look at, look at that V again in just a second. So again, in seven, chapter 7-6 seven, of configuration management, uh, it's about policies, procedures, techniques, and tools required to manage uh, evaluate proposed changes, track the status of changes, and maintain an inventory of the system and supporting documents as the changes uh, occur. Uh, so it really is, it's all about change control and documenting uh, the process and what all happened and when it happened and who did it. Um, this was the model that, that Hank Yan uh, brought up last uh, time. You know, the, from the maturity levels at the bottom, it may be, you know, from the early stages, maybe it's nothing more than just the archiving process, how you make sure you have one single version and the most recent version uh, stored so that uh, if you have to go back to that site, you've got the latest code and the latest, uh, the latest documentation associated with the project. Um, it, the next phase, which is where we're going to kind of start today, is in this versioning. Uh, how do you start a versioning process? And the, we'll be looking today at a manual system to do that. Um, as you mature even farther, the issue tracking, um, how do I go from I've got issues coming in now that need to be resolved and getting those back into all the different versions of the documents to to be sure that that I've still got a accurate uh, description and all of my code and my documentation matches up, uh, you know, for the future when I have to go back to that again. And then the last phase is kind of full-blown uh, configuration management when all disciplines, uh, your, you know, your entire, maybe even the just this whole solution, your control panel and everything that you did is all integrated into into configuration management. We're going to we're going to look at the specifics around this second phase here on versioning today and how you would do that in a manual fashion. <clears throat> so to do this, we're going to we're going to use Deming's plan do check act and and that's uh, you know this model is very well known in the in the lean and agile communities out there, but it really fits what you need to do with with the uh, configuration management. In fact, lots of different things you do as an integrator. Uh, so I'm not going to look at the specific bullets here because it's really just more about we're going to figure out, we're going to look at each section, plan, do, check, and act, what that would mean in a configuration management uh, model, especially in the uh, manual processes. So from a, from a planning perspective, um, we we need to determine what items, you'll hear me call that configuration items, but what items need controlling, uh, how you're going to control them, uh, determine who's responsible for doing what, establish how this procedure can be modified. So you build this one procedure, it's going to take on changes over time. How am I going to modify it? Document the policy and then train your team. That's all part of the planning uh, process, and all of these things are important. This is really your first phase of getting a configuration management system in place. Um, if you don't have a plan, if you don't have a documented process, it's not going to happen the way you think it's going to happen. Uh, you can have a few things that are working well for you, but ultimately, as new people come on, you won't have the methodology to train them as to how to do it, and it just makes it very easy to, to to get new people up to speed and to make sure it gives you something to gauge against when you go into the to the check part of plan, do, check, and act. So things that need to be included in your in your plan, the configuration management plan, you'll you'll have a purpose statement, you'll have definitions. 
You're going to define the things you're going to control. And we're going to spend a lot of our time today is going to be spent on project-related items because most of us, that's our what we do most of is projects. But this also applies to your internal assets, things like uh, standard operating procedures and uh, this plan in particular. How do I how do I maintain that and know that it's been changed or what what has happened to it and who did it? Um, so that would become a configuration item. Define the process for controlling each type of item. And that, you know, again, I'm going to refer to, I'm going to actually look at list of items that are internal process related and then those things that are project related in just a little bit. Then we need to define the process for tracking the status, the configuration status. And then how are we going to audit all this? Um, we need to, to be able to validate that your CM program is doing what it said it was going to do. How do you audit it? So that's the kinds of things that, that are, need to be included in, in the plan. And I'm just going to throw up a few screen captures of different ways that policy might look. This is just a table of contents. Um, what I like about this one in particular is it spells out things that are project related that are under configuration management and internal assets that are under configuration management. So in, in, in particular, it goes into documents, drawings, and program files. And you might think, well, wonder what an internal CMP item might be that's a program file. Well, that could just be your code reuse libraries. How do you, how do you know that the latest version of your real use libraries are being used and that they are, uh, that they're, you know, they're in, they've got a snapshot and we know where we're, what stage we need to be using those in. Um, but these are just very common items that need to be included. And you'll see definitions. So if we go to this, this is actually a sample purpose statement. And these slides will be available in, uh, in our uh, archives. So you'll be able to go back and look at them. But, you know, I like to use, uh, r refer to in my, in my configuration management policy, the best practices and benchmarks guide, that's where I'm getting my information from, uh, you know, why I want this plan in place, and and I'm going to grab some information from there, so refer to that. But if you look at this last part here, where it talks about what things are included, it's, in, it's including but not limited to files, drawings, program files. In addition, it, it also includes internal assets such as company standard documents and templates. So think about your purpose as you're building this plan. What all am I going to control? All of those things become configuration items when we start working through the, the process here. Just some example definitions. Again, nothing, you know, no big aha moments here but just how you would define what a document, what an internal asset is. You need to have those things so that your, your uh, employees that are using the plan understand what it is that they're controlling. All right, so we're going to switch over to the do side. We've got a plan in place. We've, and that's really kind of phase one of a configuration management system. Get your plan in place, and it's going to look different when you're in in phase one of, of the maturity model, you get to phase two, it's going to take on, it's going to get bigger. It's going to have more detail in it because um, you're doing more. So that's where we're going to start talking today. The implement The do part is implementing the plan. This is where the employees are building their deliverables and producing the required snapshots. And I, I put that in quotes because that's a term that uh, that Hank Yan used last time in the web in the webinar, and we'll go back to that and decide what is really a snapshot in time that you might need to store, and and why those are important. Um, and then for internal assets, uh, how are they? When do they need modifying, and are they being tracked cor accordingly? Do they have, you know, in, in our case, I'll actually show you for internal assets. We do use a software tool for that. Um, and through SharePoint, and it just makes that process a little bit more automated. Uh, but next time, you'll be getting into a lot more of the software side for even your, your code and other assets. So these are just some sample 
configuration items. Um, again, for internal assets, it's policies and procedures, templates, um, job descriptions, marketing materials, and then we, we list those code uh, reuse assets uh, in there as well. Um, so so uh, a question just came in, what's the name of the software tool? We use Microsoft SharePoint for doing things with internal assets. Uh, at the end of the slideshow, there'll be a list of software tools that will be, some of those will get looked at next time uh, when we do the, the software side of this. All right, for project assets, it's going to be your drawings, your design documents, um, hardware provided. This is something that most integrators, at least the ones that I've talked to, kind of forget about. You know, the, a list of the hardware you provided with part numbers, serial numbers, firmware revisions. If you had to go, if something happened to that control panel out on site and you had to recreate it, do you have all the documentation that you need to be able to build it again without having to go change up your code and all that other type of things? The other thing that that uh, we will also do is what are the what are the PCs you know the model numbers and serial numbers of those and what version of Windows and uh, what versions of software did we install on there and what other uh, types of software have we installed on those because that's all going to be important if you have to rebuild a server or a, a PC or an operator station code in the operators manuals obviously um, you know just lots of different things in the project world. But when it comes to things like the templates up in the internal assets, some of those are project templates. Some of them are, you know, process templates that you might use for other things in your company. All right, so this is just kind of a little, I'm going to drill down into a few of these in a little bit more, but this would be an example of like how you would set up your uh, folder structure is as a manual system to, to be able to track uh, these snapshots. And so you can see this happens to be the job. Uh, I've got folders for the different disciplines that are involved in this. But if I drill down into the program, just to show an example, and I went to HMI, you can see that there are multiple snapshots that are being stored. And the way those are getting stored is in a zip file that has a version number and a data to associated with it. So lots of different things there that associate with the snapshot in time that I that I grabbed. Um, gonna also show you this is this would be like for the for the drafting folder and you need to have different snapshots potentially for that. So you can see these folders here, we've got snapshots that issue for approval, issue for construction, and then when you jump down into the issue for record, you'll see you've got actual, and these these are the PDFs of those, but it's the drawing number with its rev number right in the in the file. You know, and the, one of the issues that you have with uh, when you're doing this with code is frequently you can't, uh, you, you can't store the code with rev numbers and that type of thing. So that's why you zip it up in a folder and you make it that snapshot in time as of that date. And it's a specific version number. Okay, another, another step down from that, and this is actually getting up into maybe even step three of, of uh, configuration management in the maturity model. When you start really, you know, let's say you're doing, this happens to be some custom code that we, that we wrote. Um, and so it's in C sharp. Uh, so we will track down to the, our setup files down to the actual setup package. And then, so when you go into that folder for that setup package, it has the setup, uh, exe file, but it also has a readme file. And then inside the readme, it will tell you what's changed from the previous versions. So if I need to know if that's a patch I need, or not, I can go to this README file and it'll help me understand what it was that got changed and uh, and would I want to apply that patch or not. So if, when I stored my configuration for the project, I stored that with, I'm at version 4.1.5, so if I had to go back and recreate, I would go back to my folder 4.1.5 and I'd be able to see, here's my here's my install pack for that 
and here's what really the changes from previous versions are there. And if I drill down into this, there might be setup packages for version 5 and version 4 and version 6, but that project had a version 4.1.5. I need to be able to install that. Okay, and then this is this would be like an internal asset for us and how we would track. This is in SharePoint. These are our standard operating procedures or SOPs. And you can see like on this particular item, it's checked out. So it's got a little check mark beside it and it tells me who has it checked out. And then I can, I know that somebody is working on it. Now the, the neat thing about a SharePoint site is you can build workflows in there that if the, um, if I check it back in and I've made changes to it, it goes to an approver, an automatic approver, that says, um, you know, I can't just make changes to an SOP without someone else reviewing. Whoever is responsible for this SOP needs to review it and approve my changes before anyone else sees it. So that, that's kind of at that next level for internal, uh, the uh, software-based tools. But this one's a pretty easy one to implement. And... It just right out of the box gives you a lot more of your uh, check-in, check-out, version controlling. And so that's one of the ways that uh, we do our internal assets. It doesn't work well. You can't do code, that type of thing in here. You could potentially do your zip files, but we found that the folder structure works very well for that manual part of the process that's associated with code. So again, we're, you're going to hear it when you talk about it and you go back and read Section 7.6 in Best Practices Manual. It talks about uh, configuration management baselines. And last time, Hank Yan talked about the, the snapshots that you'll take in time, and you really have to decide when you take those snapshots. It really depends on how far along you are on the maturity model um, in CM bef to, to where these snapshots are going to be taken. But... You know, we choose to take them at, you know, like for on drawings, issue for approval, issue for construction, issue for um, um, for record. Those are three of the snapshots that we'll, that we'll take. You'll have to decide where your snapshots are. But just, again, another look at that V shows that at different phases of the project, you're going to have different levels. You're going to have your CM at a different version. So way in the early stages, you've got this document out here that's at version one. And then as you progress through the project, you can see that same document now is at version three as we get closer to the close of that project. So these are the snapshots in time that we took, that we took of different items that we wanted to track. And they're gonna keep track of their own version numbers as you go. So in the, and we looked at this one a little bit already, but as far as just a practical application of a CM baseline, this is what that would look like. These are the snapshots in time that we require our folks to record for uh, drawings. So as they issue for approval, they'll have to grab a snapshot. They'll have, they'll have that set of drawings in the issue for approval when they get it responses back from the from the customer on what needs to change they make those changes now it's issued for construction after we finish the startup they'll grab the snapshot issue for record and this issue for record is really where we start in the future if we get another project with that customer that's the ones we're going to pull but we do have snapshots in time all the way along this would be the example of a um, um, an HMI, we, you know, we would say version zero is stuff we're working on right now. Once we issue it for comment, like for instance, maybe it's just the uh, static screens that we issue for comment uh, for the HMI. Uh, once we uh, issue for now, we're moving into actual building of the rest of the deliverables. We're at 1.1. When we get to factory acceptance test, we're at version two. Version 2.1 is after we fixed the things from FAT. And then version 3 is the installed, what we would call installed system. If you look at drawing names, we like to use um, Rev 
lettered revs before we issue for construction. So if it's a Rev A, I always know it's not been released for construction. Once I hit Rev Zero and through whatever num numerical, I know it's issued for construction. And really the only thing that changes when I issue for record is that it increases by one rev. And you saw in our drawing folders before, the rev number, the R2, the R3, is in the file name uh, as well. So what, what happens when changes occur, though? <clears throat> so, you know, we're building a project, and we're issuing things for approvals, and changes are going to occur. We need to decide what information was affected, how it got affected, you know, how it's going to uh, affect the final delivery, how are we going to make changes, who's going to make them, who needs to know about those changes, and how do we inform them. So a lot of this information needs to be in your policy. When you, when you define your policy as to how you're going to do this, define how you're going to do these different things, uh, and set up a process up for when a change comes in, how am I going to do something with that? So uh, Hank also, uh, Hank Yan also showed this chart, which you can't really read, but it's just, a, it's just a matter of it's a change management process. You've got a basically a flow chart that shows how you will work through a change that comes in. Uh, so it's, it's important to know, you know, what you're going to do with it and how you're going to process that change and how it's going to be put back into the other documents that not just the code, but how do I document that in my design doc now? And how do I document that in my operator's manual? Because all of those things had a potentially were at a rev one before this change came in. And now we need to modify them. We need to increase our rev and be able to match up each of those documents with the rev two of the code. And it might be that my documentation is at Rev 1 yet, or Rev 1.1, and my code might be at Rev 2.1. But somehow I have to know that Rev 1.1 of the documentation matches with Rev 2.1 um, of the code. So this is just a process. It's just a flow chart. You figure out how you're going to process changes. It's easier in a flow chart format than to put it in in words, in my opinion, I like doing it in this fashion because it's easy to follow for, you know, you can just hand it to someone, they can follow it. But it's really a formal process for change control. So one of the other things that you'll see when you read um, the 7.6 out of our best practices manual is it talks about configuration status accounting. So we need to be clear uh, what's changed, who changed it, and what date it was changed. And, you know, if you're using, like, next time when we look at those software tools that allow check-in, check-out privileges, uh, it is very easy to track. Uh, you can build the workflows right in it to, to put all the approval processes in place for a change. If you're doing it as a manual system, you need to do it in your version control. So it needs to be in the way you store the documents. So if you remember looking back at those folder structures, using dates um, in there, and then in that version document, you know, that TXT file, then you can tr keep track of uh, who it was that made the change. So here's another example of that. This is a version matrix uh, document. Uh, it's just a TXT file, so it's got the customer information and what the job number and what the description of the project was. So it, it you know, it'll, you basically your newest version will be on top, Version 3 was after SAT. It, it uh, was, was done on 2-15 of 2015. Here's the people that made the modifications. It's version 3 of the PLC code, version 3.55 of the, of the WinCC HMI app, and the operator's manual is version 1.04. Again, a very manual process. These are all just referring back to a manual a directory on the server that I can go back to and find version three of the PLC S7 code. And what was the modification that I, that I did? Here's what we did. Um, so that's a, just a quick and easy way to do 
how we would track my PLC, my HMI, my operator manual, get them all tied together so I know if that's my uh, as or found my for record documentation and for record PLC code, that's how I'm going to go rebuild the system if I need to. All right, so now we're at the check side. Why do, you know, this is all about verification that we're doing what we said we were going to do. Uh, the plan needs to dictate when you're building your plan earlier, you're going to dictate how you're going to do the inspections and who's going to do them. So if we think about that, there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of questions you need to think about as you're building your plan. First off, uh, you know, why do we need to audit? Uh, you know, this is, it is just a plan. Uh, you're going to have to verify it somehow. So we audit to make sure that it's being uh, properly focused on and it, that it, I could go back and find this at any, any time and be able to prove to myself that it is uh, what I said it was going to be. You know, we we need to audit because if a change was made, did the person that had the authority to make the change do it or approve it? Uh, we need to make sure that that release or that version met our standards before it went out. Did we get all the documentation updated? We added the code, but did we go back to the operator's manual if we needed to? Um, have every one of the configuration items been modified if a change was made? And then, you know, what needs auditing? Every, basically, we audit the configuration items for that project or for our internal audit, uh, audits, or internal assets, excuse me. Um, and then, when do I audit? Well, it's typically at these milestone phases. So when I grab a snapshot, if it's, an issue for construction, that's an audit phase. So if you, you don't audit, you know, some, some people do choose, they just do random audits and that's, that's can be successful as well. Uh, we choose to do our audits at major milestones. So when I, when I issue my four record drawings, it's going to get an audit. Um, and then who does it? Well, sometimes it could be, uh, a peer that wasn't involved in the building of that item. So it could be from another team, um, you know, somebody who's not involved in this project or that, you know, that wasn't involved with that particular SOP, making the change to that SOP. Could be a project manager, might be your operations manager, but it's typically, you know, think of it in terms of it's not the person who built the, the item. Uh, you don't want them doing self audits from this perspective. You want it to be someone with that's got some authority to require a change if it needs to be changed. Uh, so the act side of this, when we find a nonconformance, what do we do? Uh, we've got to have a plan for what we're going to do with a nonconforming uh, piece, and then you know sometimes. It might mean that it's just training. You know, maybe we didn't train very well the folks on how to use the configuration management tools that we're developing or our folder structures or whatever it might be. Sometimes it's your plan isn't working, so you need to modify your plan in some way. Um, that's all great, uh, but anytime you make a modification, you're going to need to retrain the member. So if the plan's not accomplishing the goal, um, you're going to need to do something. Uh, modify the plan and retrain the people. Anytime you make a change to your configuration management plan, you need to retrain your folks on uh, what, what it is they need to be doing. Uh, and I guess probably one of the things that we've noticed probably the most is, uh, you know, as you bring on new people, uh, new people tend to follow the plan easier um, and more to the T than the folks that have been here the longest because they don't know any different. And But as they see your experienced people not doing it the same way, if you're not auditing and correcting that, they're going to go to uh, start doing it the same way as your least, uh, the, the person that follows it the least because that's obviously the easiest way. So. So just a quick um, quick review of the things that we talked about 
so far, I mean, it, well, this is basically we're going to be coming up to the Q&A section because I wanted to make sure I left some time for Q&A today. Really, it's all about it, it starts with this configuration management plan. If, if you do an, a good job of building that plan and and as an uh, integrator that's new to configuration management, start small. Uh, the first thing that I did back probably in our second CSIA audit, um, I went out and found the most complicated configuration management plan that I could find on the Internet. I didn't realize it was that comp complicated, but it was 40 or 50 pages long. And when I when I was audited in the third third uh, cycle, uh, the very first thing that the auditor had to say to me was, I, I wonder how well your people are following this plan, because it was so complicated. And I, it was very obvious people were not using the plan. Uh, it was just way too complicated. We were not near at that level yet. And so had to back off and build a plan that was at the level that we were at, and then we modify the plan as we go. So again, that's down the road when you realize, all right, we're ready for a different level of maturity. We're ready to build a, a stronger plan, and we're going to go back through the Plan, Do, Check, Act uh, sequence, but with a stronger CM plan. So during the due cycle, we're executing the plan. And this is really just where the rubber is going to hit the road. Are your folks storing the proper snapshots? And it's a guaranteed, if you're not checking, you're not getting. Uh, it, takes it takes monitoring, especially in the early phases of implementing uh, configuration management. What you, what you uh, inspect is what you will get. You don't get what you expect. That was something somebody taught me a long time ago. Uh, you get what you don't get what you expect. You get what you inspect. And it might feel weird at first, but depending on how much inspection you do with your team in the first place, it may really feel weird. But it is important for the CM side because it's going to be so counterintuitive to some of the things they've been doing in the past. It just it's more. Uh, paperwork they'll they'll tell you. I can tell you anytime where my what my code where the latest version of the code is until they can't show you where the latest version of the code is or their hard drive crashed and the latest version of the code was on there. Uh, so it's a it's really a um, a process that you really do need to do the verification. So that check piece is a is a significant uh, variable that that fits into this. And it needs to be someone other than the team members that do the checking, as we stated before, and just making sure the plan's being followed. And if it's not, we talked about what to do there. We're going to act. If it's not being followed, you react quickly, but it could be just retraining or the plan's just not working. I need to modify the plan and retrain. So that's kind of the, um, the big picture items as to, uh, as to what manual configuration management is, is like. And, and again, you'll get a copy of these slides. You can go out and grab these from, uh, we'll post this whole presenta presentation out on the website. But go back and look at those uh, directory structures. We found that to be very useful in, in tracking those. So, uh, you know, give that a, give that a shot. The, uh, the next piece that we're going to do is on the software-based uh, CM system. So, Obviously, when, at the earlier maturity levels of CM, it's, it's, uh, you don't have a lot of tools that you have to do. It's really, even in this manual phase, it's just about organization at that phase and discipline. As you get to the software phase, now you've got money that you're investing in uh, software tools. So you are going to have to, you know, build some uh, build some uh, processes around those software tools, but you're going to have to invest money in buying the tools and then maintaining the support contracts with those uh, year after year. So it does cost you more up in that upper level as well. So if you can do well at the manual side, a lot of people don't uh, move to the software-based side. 
And I think that uh, that'll bring us back to, I'm going to open it up for uh, if there's any questions that uh, you guys might have on just manual configuration management that I could help, uh, type me up a chat in the box and uh, we'll address those things for you. Okay, so one, pro one that just came in was, do you change your approach based on the project size? Uh, that's a, it's a great question, and absolutely, it's, you're going to address that in your uh, configuration management plan. Uh, we do have uh, varying levels of configuration management uh, based on project size, and I, I think, you know, if it's a, we, we just kind of do it by dollar, by revenue size, and revenue meaning the uh, we, we look at uh, the amount of, of uh, manpower that we're going to have to put to it. So labor revenue, we'll base our labor revenue, we'll look at that and we'll decide, is this going to have full CM or are we going to do kind of light CM on this one? That's a great question. And one thing I'll just encourage you there too is think of it in terms of, you're going to start off with very light CM. Pick the minimum things that you need to do to, to just know what we went from the very start. Do I know that I have the latest version of the code? Do I know that I can produce the latest version of the drawing set for this, for this package? Think of it in those terms because if I had to recreate this, the customer calls and said, hey, I lost my operator's manual, can you give me a copy of the latest version? And it's been modified. Can I do that? That's the very basic level of CM. All right, Jeff, any other? I, yeah, Jeff, go ahead. I got, I, got, I got a question there for you. came in for okay. SHAP. How long did this process take you to implement? Okay, that's a really good question as well. Uh, as I've stated, uh, and actually when Bob was was talking, we were – uh, the last time I had updated my, my profile, we had gone through four audit cycles. We've now hit our fifth. This last January, we were re-audited for the fifth time. And I will tell you that uh, we're still working on it. We still are in the maturity model. The initial phases of it can, you know, it's going to, it takes you about three to six months before your teams start to get used to doing it well. If you're not at doing anything today that I would consider configuration management, it's going to take you some time to get that kind of that CM light level put together. Uh, but, again, I'll just encourage you, start slow. Don't build this monster plan that when they look at it, their eyes gloss over and, and they, they realize there's no way they can do this because they won't follow it, guaranteed. That's what I did on by uh, my second audit. I had done that after the second audit into the third, and between the third and fourth, I had to go back to CM Light. Jeff, this is Bob. Do you run training programs for everyone that would be imp impacted by a CM policy? That's a yeah, another good uh, another good question. Typically, anybody who's going to be impacted if they whether I've got to go find the documents you know I'm uh, the person maybe I've got an admin that's responsible for issuing the the four record uh, package they will get training the for persons that are responsible for taking the snapshots are going to get training and the ones that are responsible for kind of monitoring or doing the check phase of it are going to get the training on it so that would include, for example, anyone who does drawings, like in the drafting department? Correct. They're, they would have to know. Uh, they need to know how the drawing, the file structure is going to work, um, how our, you know, if you go to our uh, file server, we will have these, these directories are, we have a template directory set up for new jobs. So that directory for issue for approval, issue for construction, issue for record is already there. 
Mm-hmm. All they need to do is, as they are doing that phase in time, store it in there. So what we're training them on is what what indicates whether it goes in this folder versus the other folder. Mm-hmm. What would be your what would be your clue that I should store here versus there? And that's probably one of the biggest keys to CM. Take as much of that work off of their hands. Build your templates. Build your uh, folder structure if you're going to use that to to track it, and then just teach them how to name their zip files and you know how to, where to store them. That's probably the the level that you go to initially. If I have a project that involves some PLC code, some drawings, and and one HMI, and it's a seventy-five thousand dollar project, and then I have another project that has those same three components, but it's a half a million dollar project. Project, what would it? What is it that I might take out of the CM system for the small seventy-five thousand dollar project that I might not do on a really big job? <clears throat> It, it usually revolves around the number of snapshots that you wind up taking. Okay. For instance, most small projects, um, you don't have, you may not be even doing issue for approvals because they're, you know, you're doing a real small change to a, to a, an existing system. So there may not be any need for issue for approval. Um, the, the directory structure is already set up. You know, the way we do it, the directory structure is already there. Mm-hmm. So if they're doing approvals, even on a $75,000 job, they'll do it. They'll put them in there. It's really just a matter of most of the time on the smaller projects, you're going to have fewer snapshots along the way. And, you know, like the in-progress stuff that we're doing, um, you know, in that development phase, uh, how you store your daily code um, you know, the making sure it gets put back out on the network. And this is really a discipline thing, too. You know, I, I mentioned earlier, you know, when the latest version was on the guy's laptop and he was flying home from, you know, the from the plant after he had started it up, and we get the call that we've got a problem and we don't have the latest code. Uh, you know, so the discipline for what he needs to do before he leaves the site, you know, that doesn't matter if it's a – uh, easy job or one that doesn't have much revenue or one that does have a lot. Typically, it's in our in our world, it's been more revolving around the number of snapshots that we take. Okay. Okay. So the methodology remains pretty much the same. It's exactly. It's just more like the frequency of doing things that that might be less demanding on a small job versus a large job. Correct. Correct. Okay. Okay, any other questions? Well, while people are thinking, let me just start a little bit of a closing process here. Um, first of all, Jeff, thanks very much. Uh, I want to, everyone that's on the line yet, which is just about everybody who started, there are four important considerations um, going forward here with CSIA. First and foremost, um, send your management team to the CSIA conference, which is April 29th to May 2nd. There are 23 educational sessions over a period of two and a half days, and um, just so much to learn about how to make your company the best company it can possibly be. Number two is there is project management training uh, that is concurrent with the conference. It's called a common sense approach to automation upgrades and system migrations. And uh, so, and the lunches and breaks and evening events and so forth. Uh, would be attended by those who are in this uh, this workshop, uh, just the same as the those who are attending the conference. So there are many many networking opportunities as well, and the cost is only one hundred dollars above the cost of coming to the conference, and that essentially covers the cost of um, workshop materials. Number three, um, after the conference ends, stay for Saturday evening's farewell party for me. <laughs> Um, I don't know if everyone knows, but I'm retiring from CSIA at the end of May, and um, so you can see me off. Anyway, uh, the number four item is the exchange. Um, That's our new website from nearly a year ago now. If your um, company isn't on it to the greatest extent possible, it's an amazing tool for end-user clients to find integrators like you, so be sure your profile is set up well 
and that and I would encourage spending a few extra dollars and going to the gold profile. It's the best value. So those are a few things I wanted to say while we waited to see if any additional questions came in. I don't see any. Uh, Jeff, Monica, how about you? Nope, I don't see any on my list either. I haven't got any, any more questions either, so. Okay. Well, with that, I'm just going to say to all of the attendees, thank you for your participation. And my hope is that the, the fog, <clears throat> excuse me, that the fog that typically surrounds configuration management uh, has lifted at least a little bit today. Of all the things in our best practices manual, this is the one that seems to be the most the most challenging. Um, Jeff, thank you very much for your contribution of time and expertise. Uh, your presentation was really very insightful. And you know, it's, I know you do a lot of these. I just looked in the last two years, you've done four webinars. And I want to say thank you very much for all the time it takes to prepare and, and actually execute it. So uh, we wish the best for you and for interstates, and we thank interstates for giving you the time to do these things. Um, you bet. Thanks. Oh, you're, yeah, we appreciate it. And thanks again to our host and sponsor, John Weber and uh, Monica Anderson of Software Toolbox. And you attendees, you will see a survey come into your inbox very soon after the webinar ends. It literally takes 30 seconds to complete it. And we'd ask that you do that so that we get some feedback and we know how we're doing. Are there any additional questions? Don't think so. With that, I'm going to say thank you again for attending. This is Bob Lowe, CSI Executive Director. Take care. Goodbye. <laughs>